Matthew chapter 14, verse 22. Jesus got done feeding the 4,000. And to go into the next verses, you get the attitude of the disciples. And straightway, Jesus constrained his disciples to get into a ship. You ever look up the word constrain or you just read the Bible? It's to urge, to force, to compel. All right, guys, get in the boat. Now, we're cleaning up here. I'll take care of the motus. Get in the boat, and we're going on the other side. The disciples, when we started, had an attitude. Here comes all the multitudes. Oh, my, what we're going to do? Matthew said, hey. Will you get them out of here? Send them into town. We got no time for them. Luke and John told us, here they come. We ain't got enough money for food. That's interesting. When you read and study, see, you don't read the Bible and say, okay, look, I finished a year. What'd you learn? Now, I'm going to show you something in a moment that people say, and it's wrong. And you better change what you say. Because what you say is not Bible. And if you say what you say, you're perverting the Bible. Isn't that important? To go before him into the other side. While he sent the multitudes away. So as far as dispersing the multitudes, Jesus is going to take care of it. He puts the disciples in the boat. Uh, I wonder, and he had to compel them. There's something going on. And when he had sent the multitude away, he went up into a mountain apart to pray alone. Isn't it funny? God, who is Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ is God. I don't care what the Jehovah Witnesses are. They're liars. You tell them I said they're liars. Jesus went and prayed himself. For anybody who would think, well, I don't have to pray. Jesus did. And when the evening was come, after 6 p.m., he was there alone. Finally, the people dispersed. There he is praying. He's all by himself. But the ship was now in the midst of the sea. Sea of Galilee. Tossed with waves. For the wind was contrary. And they're in a storm. In the fourth watch of the night. Now in the night there are four watches. The first watch is 6 p.m. to 9 a.m. The second watch is 9 a.m. The midnight. The third watch is 12 or, or midnight, the 3 a.m., the three hours. And then the fourth watch is 3 a.m. to 6 p.m. So between 3 and 6 a.m., the fourth watch between 3 and 6 p.m., Jesus went on to them walking on the water. Is that what the Bible says? How many times did Jesus walked in the water? All right. Take John 6. John, verse, John chapter 6. Verse 19. So when they had rolled about 5 to 20 or 30 furlongs, they see Jesus... Walking on the sea. Walking on the sea. People say he walked on the water. John said walking, and John's a fisherman. John said walking on the sea. Look at Mark six forty-eight. 
Mark 6, 48. And he saw them toiling and rolling, for the wind was contrary unto them, about the fourth watch of the night, coming to walking upon the sea. Matthew 14. Verse 24. Now when the ship, now he was, uh, no, uh, verse 25. Matthew 14, 25. In the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went on them walking on the sea. When you say Jesus walked on the water, that's not scripture. Matthew, Mark, and John. I'm sorry. I don't care what your pastor said. I don't care what your Sunday school teacher. I don't care what your grandma said. I don't care what mom said. I care what the King James Bible says. The King James Bible says he walked on the sea. People say, oh, Jesus walked on the water. No, he walked on the sea. And there, you know, there's some heretics out there that said he walked on ice. In the midst of a storm, the waves were in going in and out of the ship. That's some funky kind of ice. So let's get the Bible correct now. Let's start saying Jesus walked on the sea. Said rather Jesus walked on the water. Because I'll show you in a moment what why it's wrong. And when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, did you get it the first time? Get it the, the fifth time. Matthew, Mark, and John say the sea. It's important because if you say on the water, you're misquoting the Bible. And when you misquote the Bible, you are sinning against the God because God says don't change his word. Shall I give a moment for you all to, to seek God in prayer and, and confession? And the Holy Spirit to remind you next time you want to say it, you will say on the sea. And quote the Bible correctly. They were troubled saying... It is a spirit. So the disciples, 12 of them, believe in ghosts. Here comes a ghost. Ah! And they cried out for fear because it's a ghost. It's between 3 and 6 a.m. Look at Mark 6. We're looking at, this, we're, we're looking at this walking on the sea. See, it's simple to say. Once you know what to say. Verse 48. And he saw them toiling toil and rowing. For the wind was contrary to them, and about the fourth watch of the night, which is between 3 a.m. and 6 a.m., walking on the sea. John. Gospel of John. 6. Verse 19, so when they rode about 5 and 20 or 30 furlongs, they see Jesus walking on the sea, drawing nigh unto the ship, and they were afraid. Now, my question is always be when we go back to Matthew. It's the middle of the morning. How on earth did they see Jesus? You think about that? You can't say full moon or the moon because they're in a storm. <coughs> what the disciples see is something coming at them. That it makes them think it's a ghost. 
It's a spirit. It's a ghost. But straightway Jesus spake on him, saying, Be of good cheer. It is I. Be not afraid. And Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it be thou, bid me to come unto thee on the water. He was like, hey, if Jesus can do it, let me do it. And he said, Jesus said, come. And when Peter was come down out of the ship, So the ship has some kind of platform that he had to come down and then get in the water. Now look at this. Look at verse 29. He walked on the water. Who walked on the water? Peter did. Not Jesus walked on the sea. Peter walked on the water. So when you say Jesus walked on the water... You have you got trouble. Because there's a church that says that Peter was the first pope. And if you give credit to what Jesus is doing to Peter in the standpoint of that church you're on some shaky ground, brother. Remember, Jesus walked on the sea, Peter walked on the water. Now there's three things about Peter we're going to look at in a moment. To go to Jesus. But when he saw the wind boisterous, he was afraid. And he would see the waves. He wouldn't see the wind. Made of clothes he was wearing. And beginning to sink, he cried, saying, Lord, save me. Now, three things about Peter. He can say, oh, Peter, you know, he's the, he, he's the outspoken one. He's the one, you know. He's the only one that got out of the boat. James, John, Matthew, Judas, the eleven stayed in the boat. Why didn't they get out of the boat? Why was Peter the only one? Peter, <coughs> Peter was the only one that could get back in the boat, and he will get back in the boat. Man, that was wonderful. Until, you know, my faith lacked. To, to walk like I walked, you, you won't believe what it felt like. What did it feel like? Was it hard? Was You know, I always wondered with Jesus walking on the sea, did, his, did he kind of float? <laughs> Did he, did he walk like he was walking on puddles? Did it splash? Did his feet get wet? Did he like kind of wade? What did he do? There's more to... Uh, what on earth happened? To, and then Peter steps out. What? I mean, he's having a good old time to the wind blow. And we don't know how far away from the boat. And here's, one, here's number two. It says in verse 29, the end, to go to Jesus. He got out of the boat and he went walking to Jesus. Nowhere else. We don't know how far he got away from the boat. We don't know how far he got to Jesus. Before he was frightened by the storm, but he, he, he got out of the boat, and he's walking to Jesus. 
What would your modern Christians do? They get out of that boat and start dancing, start jenny whacking. Now you head off in a different, whole different direction today. May they take their cameras out, take selfies. But when he saw the wind was broached, he was afraid. I'd be afraid too. <laughs> and beginning to sink, he cried, saying, Lord, save me. Number three, when he was in trouble, he cried out to the Lord. With two words. Save me. He trusted Jesus to get out of the boat. He trusted to walk to Jesus. And then in time of trouble, he trusted Jesus. In the midst of that time, he lost his faith. Now let me ask you a question. In the realm of eternity, Of all the men from Adam, and all the men that will be, whenever the Lord ends it all, how many people can an account in New Jerusalem that they walked on the water or walked on the sea? Two, Jesus and Peter, and that's it. Not even Paul. Surely not one of the great prophets of the of the Old Testament. Elijah and Elijah parted the waters of the Jordan. They didn't walk across them. Moses parted the Red Sea and the Jordan and a couple other rivers, but they didn't walk across it. Peter is out in the middle of a sea, in a storm, walking on the water. A wind, wind comes up for him and he gets frightened. And immediately Jesus stretched forth his hand and caught him and said unto him, O thou little faith, wherefore didst thou doubt? Now your typical modern Christian Baptist today would say, Oh, come on Jesus, light up. Uh, at least he did it. You're rude in your crew. You should give him a lollipop because he was out there. Now, I'm telling you something. If I was in that state, I don't know if I would got out of the boat. I don't even know if I would even try to get out of the boat with one man already stepping out. And had I stepping out and got out that far and the wind would be boisterous, I would have got scared too. And Jesus' attitude is why did you doubt? There is no excuse before God. Well, I was a color. I grew up in this thing. My dad disappeared. Uh, uh, I, I, I can't speak. I can't talk. I can't walk. I can't lame. I can't. I can't. I wouldn't. I couldn't. I know. Blah blah. God don't care. And we're in the Christmas season right now. Well, God, what do you mean you're charging me with 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 Paganism. Because it's paganism. Well, no one told me. Alright, where do you find Christmas tree in the Bible? Where do you find stockings? Where do you find Santa Claus? Where do you find Black, Black Friday? Where do you find credit card? Where do you find sitting around the tree of the family? Where do you find that in the Bible? Well, it's not in there. Uh, duh. Why on earth would you go and cut down a tree and bring it in the house?
Why would you take your stock and put them by the by the by the fireplace and stuff them? All right, in the age of the telephones and all that, give me a picture of Santa Claus. Come on. Of all the people in the world and all the times we've had cell phones with cameras, show me an actual picture of Santa Claus, and yet you believe in him. Let's try the Easter Bunny. Let's try the Tooth Fairy. Let's try the, did I say Easter Bunny? Or does he get two rounds? How come you believe in all that mess? And you can't believe in my son Jesus, or you can't believe the very pages of the Bible. I'm going to top it off for some people. Some people, I have put somebody in your life who has told you is paganism. They put videos out there. They put works out there. You've heard them. You hated them. You despised them. And I sent them. You're in worse predicaments. There is no excuse before God. Because you could have, should have, hood have. When you read your Bible once through the year, and you read it two years, three years, four years, five years, six, I, Schofield Bible, the Schofield Bibles I've had, I had three, four, five of them, I don't know how many I've had. I read every single year since 2000. It's 22. So I've at least read my Bible through 22 times. Not counting all, all the, you know, commentaries I've done. Well, what I'm saying is, you're going to find it in the Bible, or you're not going to find it in the Bible when it comes to doing things in life. I don't find Santa Claus. But I do find merry-making and gift-giving, and it has nothing to do with God. I do find a tree de decorated in the Bible in Jeremiah and say, oh, is it really? And then go to a church and they got a nice Christmas tree up on the piano and we go from Jeremiah 9 <clears throat> conveniently to Jeremiah 11. Uh-oh, well, what chapter did we? I've been in two pastors' houses and they had a Christmas tree. And I had one pet. I, I, listen, I didn't say nothing. One pet. Well, you know, we get a tree. It's just beautiful. The kids and all that. I didn't say nothing. And another pastor, you know, almost the same thing. It's like I got written on my on me. I'm a Christmas tree hater. No, I'm just true. I had one Christian one time. It was the middle of the year. And we're at this church. And he comes up to me. And he goes, "What? So what's so what's so wrong with the Christmas tree?" Yeah, you know. Your conscience deep inside you know. Peter has Jesus right there. There have been no excuse. You know what Peter sh should have started doing? Started running. But, like I said, today... Today's Baptist church, today's Christian mindset, you would ball out Jesus for not being tender hearted and kind and sweet words. That's not the modern Jesus today in verse 31. Peter was in the wrong. In that case, it would have been far better for Peter to stay in the boat. you got to think about in your Christian walk, especially if, if you're going to be a disciple. Not all Christians are disciples. Listen, in, in the discipleship that God's given me, in the ministry that God's given me, I've had my family forsake me. I've had pastors forsake me. I've had churches forsake me. I've had peop men and women forsake me. I've, had, I've been a, a, a hatred of people. I have been a, a talk about of people. I've had the police know me as a, as a criminal. 
I, I have been like Jesus, despised and rejected. I have said about Christians, have I become your enemy because I've spoken the truth? Now, if you cannot take that, if you cannot take being talked about, don't go into the ministry be a pastor. Don't plan on going out and witnessing for Jesus. Expect everybody to love you, cutie boo, and everybody just loves Jesus. Don't expect every house that you knock on, they're going to come in, bite you in, have iced tea, tea and coffee. No. I can tell you some stories. You better really, Jesus said, you know, if a man hate not himself, his mother, his wife, his children, because they're going to be tight. Listen, in my, in one of my marriages was, you know what, I'm going to serve God. You know, you can stop if you want to. And ruin a good ministry I had. I stay firm. I, I'm still trying to serve the Lord. I I have had physical ailments of, of health. And I still want to do something. And when they come into the ship, the wind ceases. <laughs> Why didn't Jesus make the wind cease when Peter was out there on the, on the sea or the water? Because just because you're saved does not mean the storms do not come. Getting saved does not make you rich. Getting saved does not make you healthy. Getting saved does not make everything well. It does not fix your divorce you were getting into. Getting saved is not a medicated red pill or a drink. Getting saved changes that you go from hell to heaven. And if you're going to live right, and you're going to set forth your life by the Bible, <laughs> your problems have just only begun. I've got Christian family members. They don't want anything to do with me. Perfectly fine. Because I'm going to do right. I've got churches that don't want anything to do with me. It's okay. You go about your Christmas party. You go about your Jesus party. Wrapping toilet paper for Jesus. And, on Christmas. and then when you get to heaven... You're going to have loss. Because that's all paganism. Now we all sin. The wind ceased when they got in the boat. So Peter, just because you said, hey, I'm going to step out. I'm the only one stepping out. That did not calm the storm. There are Christians out there, realize that there are Christians out there who are in a hospital bed today. They can't move. And they're going to be in that hospital bed to the day they see Jesus. As much as the, of the destruction that Florida has had with two hurricanes in 2022, some of them home, some of them homes were Christian homes. Some of them were church buildings. They got these rash of tornadoes right now and threatening a tornado going from Texas all the way up, to, to, up through Pennsylvania and all that. If a tornado starts and it's in your path, Christian, it may hit your house. And it may skip over to your unsaved neighbor's house and spare their house and get yours. There are Christians today in third world countries, they are in jail because of the Bible. There are saved, born again, going to heaven, Bible-believing Christians that are in cancer wards. 
You can't pick up your Bible and say the blood of Jesus Christ and your cancer be healed. No, I've had two wives die of cancer. I'm sorry, I don't care how much you pray. I don't care how many you get to pray. I, mean, I, had, I had people all over the world when my wife leaves. She had to go home. There was nothing more. If she had lived any longer, it would have been just as worse for her. And there are there are ministries out there, I don't know what kind of ministry, but they will tell you salvation, everything be hunky gory, great and smell. And if, if it's not hunky dory well and, and rich and all that, you are a sinner, you are done something wrong against God. That, that, that man is preaching that mess is the one that's done wrong. Then they that were in the ship came and worshipped him, saying, Of truth, thou art the Son of God. Okay, they acknowledge it. But as we go later on, they still don't get it. These men, oh, thou the Son of God, there's no more store. All right, let's roll. Great Jesus, hallelujah, glory to God. Where are these men the night that Jesus died? Three days later. They're in the upper room with the doors locked. <laughs> oh, Jesus, God, he's not going to go. <laughs> and how many times did Jesus tell him? Three days and three nights. As, as a sign of, of, of Jonas. They didn't get it. After the resurrection of, of Jesus and he's seen it, Peter said, all right, I go fishing. <laughs> Let's go back to what we were doing. And when they were gone over, they came to the land of Gennesaret. And when the men of the place had knowledge of him, guess what's going to happen again? Hey, look who's getting off the boat. Who? Jesus. Go in town and get everybody. <laughs> you think the disciples are pleased again? Because what? They sent out of the country roundabout and brought unto him all that were diseased. You remember... You remember, let's go back over here, uh, verse number, uh, where is it? 15, verse 14, Jesus went forth and saw a great multitude with, and moved compassion toward them, and he healed their sick, and when it was even, the disciples came to him and said, this is a desert place, the time is now past, send them away, send the multitude away. Verse 35, we're back to healing again. We're back to a multitude of people. Exactly what the disciples didn't want. It's right there. All him that were diseased, they need healing. Quite a bit of people. You know, these mega churches that, you know, they want all these people and they got all these people. And they got associate pastor, associate to the associate pastor, associate, associate to the, to the janitor that cleans the toilet, associate. And you don't get no personal attention in those churches. You're just a head bobber. In the Baptist churches today, you know what? Bring them in, bring them in. But the Christians that, who are there, they're saved. They're, they're members of that church. Uh, the pastors got their clicks. And they say, well, Peter, Jesus had his Peter, James, and John. What do you mean you want more? What do you mean bite them in the church? You can't even take care of the sheep that are sitting there in the church right now. They feel left out. And if you have a sheep who is taken away by a wolf with the name Jehovah Witness from your congregation, you as a pastor need to be tarred and feathered and hung up 
in a tree with a message, Ichabob. The glory has departed. No one of your sheep should go off to a to a cult without you trying to stop them. No one of your sheep should sit in their house as a uh, I just had the word and I went out the window. A shut in. Without you visiting them. You're not getting no more sheep because you haven't taken care of the sheep that God's given you. And woe be to the pastor that takes himself off to another church, to another church, to another church, to another church. You're not a pastor. You're a evangelist. How dare you wear the, the title of a pastor of a church when you're not there 365 days of the year outside of holiday to take care of your sheep at all times. Oh, but you are conveniently there to have part in a marriage. You are the pastor that affiliates a marriage. But how many times of the year did you leave that church? Yeah, a lot of you guys, you want the title of pastor. But you don't want to stick around and take care of the sheep. Because the sheep like the butt. The sheep like the butt. If you go to another church, you can leave that church. I had, one, I had evangelists say that one time. He goes, I come in, I stir up the sheep, I get the sheep all angry, I get them all torn up, and then I leave, and the pastor's like, oh, would you? thank you very much. And besought him that they might only touch the hem of his garment. It got to a point, if I could just, he's so busy, if I could just touch... Is him like that woman who had bled for 12 years? That got around. And you know, there was a woman that just touched the hem and she was healed. Where'd they get that from? Go to Luke chapter 9. Luke chapter 9. Luke chapter 9. All right, Luke 9 10 is the feeding of the 5,000. Verse. 10 down to 17. All right, look at Luke 8, verse 40 to 48. Look at verse 44. Came behind and touched the border of his garment. Immediately her issue of blood had stunned. That happened before... The feeding of the 5,000. That happened before the, the, the storm in the sea. That happened before where Jesus now. That got out. <laughs> All you got to do is touch him. And as many as touched him were made perfectly whole. Remember that group of... I don't know if it's in Luke where we are. Uh... Look at verse 45. Here it is. Luke. And Jesus said, Who touched me? With all denied, Peter and they, the disciples that were with him, said, Master, the multitude thronged thee and pressed thee, and sayest thou who touched me? The disciples with all this multitude 
What do you mean, who touched you, Jesus? I just got an elbow in the face. I just got an elbow in my rib. I stepped on my foot. What do you say, who touched me, Jesus? All these, will you get, and by the time you get to the feet of the Father, will you get rid of these people? Okay. You get in the boat. Get in the boat. Get on the side. He had pours them. Get in that boat. Go. I'll be out with you in a moment. And the storm comes. Jesus walks on the sea. Peter walks on the water. They get in the boat. They get on the other side after the storm stops. And guess what they got again? A multitude of people. And they're doing the same thing that woman did. Trying to get and touch the border of his You know, when you see these movies about Jesus and the disciples and all that, they are full of bunkers garbage, doo-doo. I can't say bad words about doo-doo. But I got words to say about these Hollywood movies. Because the Bible gives us an impression that you would not be able to tell Jesus because he was in the midst of a group of people. But when they make these Hollywood movies, you know, when Rocky wins the battle, he's surrounded by all these people. When the star wins the, the championship or fights the battle, he's among all the people. They're so happy. When America wins in the movies, the soldier gets surrounded by all the people. And when you make a movie about Jesus, he's only got 12 people around him. Bull. Bull. That's what, yeah. At church, uh, we love to, we're going to have a Friday night movie, church movie. You mean where George Stevenson is going to say he's John the Baptist? Oh, yeah. Well, oh, he's lying because he's not John the Baptist. How dare you get a movie where somebody claims to be Jesus? Is that star sinless? You get a guy, he, he's going to play Moses. Oh, really? Come on down here, and I'll show him the Halifax River. Let's just see him part the Halifax River. Not a sea, just a river. Part the Halifax River so we can go walk across. But you're Moses. Okay? Oh, oh you want to be Elijah in the Hollywood movies? All right, come over to my house. Here's a gallon of milk, only a gallon of milk. You make sure that gallon of milk stays a gallon of milk every time I pour cereal every morning. You're Elijah. You're Adam. Show me the side of the scar where your wife came from. You get these Hollywood movies. Well, you know, oh, some of the movies, they're about Christian morals and all that. Is the actor a Christian? A born-again, Bible-believing Christian? Or are they being paid like a harlot? To act like a Christian. Listen, it really plays out in the Bible. It's always better in the book rather than in the Bible. I mean, it's better rather in the Bible than it is the movie. 